Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks to HashiCorp for having me. My name is Jeff. I dev the SEC and I SEC the ops. My company, Immutability LLC, is developing a set of tools and protocols to curate and provision credentials, access controls, and secrets-oriented infrastructure. This talk will be an interactive narrative about using Vault plugins to help bring uh, blockchain to the enterprise. I only have about 35 minutes, so there'll be no intro to blockchain or no intro to Vault, but if you see me anytime during the conference, please feel free to reach out. But first two things. If you're at all like me, you might want to play along while I'm talking. And to that end, you can go to my GitHub, immutability-io. Let's go there. And if you go clone the Vault Ethereum plugin, clone this repo, and go into the, the helper directory, there's a set of scripts that will install Vault and the plugin exactly the way I'm demoing it here. If you have Keybase and JQ, you can use these scripts as is. If not, you'll have to muck about. Well, so the second thing is, take note of my Twitter handle. There will be a quiz during this. And that quiz may involve much wow, or at least some wow. All right, so what will we talk about? Vault as a platform, what does that mean? Well, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, the web was just a place to share markup files with embedded hyperlinks. However, it took only a few enabling extensions for web servers to become platforms for web applications, and the world changed. Last year, the Vault team introduced the ability for us to craft custom plugins. And I believe that this is the enabling extension that elevates Vault from a secrets management tool to a platform for secrets applications. Blockchain is a secrets-oriented application. Every blockchain transaction requires access to a private key. Now I'm gonna take it as a given, without any attempt at justification, that we wanna use blockchain in the enterprise. Despite all the hype, every large financial company that I know of has at least one, if not many, blockchain projects in the works. Even JP Morgan, whose CEO has contributed much FUD to this space, built and maintains Quorum, which is an enterprise-oriented version of Ethereum. And while this talk focuses specifically on a Vault plugin for public Ethereum, there's nothing about the blockchain problems we're solving for that are specific to public blockchain or to Ethereum. So I mentioned problems. What are the problems? Well, when an enterprise makes financial transactions, it does so within a regulatory framework that has many controls to prevent the illegitimate transfer of funds. You may have heard of the FinCEN call, uh, kill chain. If your credit card is stolen, transactions can be rolled back. If wire fraud occurs, you can call the FBI or the Secret Service. And complying with anti-money laundering laws is not optional. In contrast to this, blockchains are immutable. In this world, a loss of your private keys can, be a total, can mean a total loss of all funds. There is no regulatory body or institutional apparatus that can roll back the blockchain. And there are no AML, AML controls. Some would call that a feature. So there are a few problems. And ultimately, the first step in designing anything is to think about the problems that you want to solve. So our problem is, how do we construct a set of controls that make it safe-ish to use blockchain in the enterprise? But are we begging the question as regards a problem? Can't we just run an Ethereum node and use one of the many native wallets? Well, let's take a look at Ethereum. It's your standard issue decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. Every node is the same, the code is the same, the blockchain is the same. With one important exception, your private keys only live on your local node. So let's say you've spent a few days, weeks, months, syncing a full node to the blockchain, and you want to use that node as an enterprise wallet. What do you need to do? Well, the first thing you're going to need to do is open up that node to remote traffic. Well, there is no authentication. There is no TLS. 
Ethereum is trustless, that means we don't trust DNS, we don't trust certificate authorities. So you won't be sending any passphrases or credentials over the wire. So we have to get onto this node in order to use these private keys. We do that by unlocking them, which makes them available to any subsequent transactions that hit that node, which is unfortunate because we just opened up that node to remote unauthenticated traffic. Now, we also have no audit trail of access to these private keys. Whoops. And there are no controls limiting to whom or how much we can transact, and can't, can transact with. And the passphrase is pretty damn precious too. Loss of a passphrase is equivalent to a loss of keys. In light of these facts, our problem is narrowed. How do we build a multi-user wallet with fine-grained access controls, transaction governance? How do we do this? I contend Vault can help. It does robust multi-user fine-grained access control with auditability out of the box. But why do we need a plug-in? Can't we just use Vault to store private keys? Well, you'd have to mint your keys outside of Vault and put them in, then pull them out of Vault again in order to sign transactions, generate public keys and addresses, which contradicts our goal of preventing the exposure of private keys. So I think we need a plug-in. And how in the world do we do that? Well, the first thing to think about when you design a plugin is what kind of operational environments you're going to need to support. How are you going to support the development, testing, and operation of, run type, of production systems? This, will, this discovery process is going to influence the type of configuration pro options your plugin needs. So here's an example. We have isolated dev, sit, and prod environments. In our dev environment, we're, we're pointing to a private Ethereum testnet. In our sit environment, we're pointing to the public Rinkeby testnet. And in prod, of course, we're pointing to the Ethereum mainnet. This may be a familiar deployment model to companies who must comply with regulations governing access to production data. Network segmentation may even be involved. In other scenarios, a single vault cluster may support multiple environments. This is the model we're going to use for our demo. Now we're going to want to make Vault do what this picture shows. So without further ado, let's do that. So enter the CLI and I will have to change to this and enter the CLI and put on my glasses. Can you guys see that? All right. Maybe that's not going to help me. All right, come on, scroll up, please. There we go. All right, good. First thing we're going to do is check to see if Vault is running. And indeed it is. We're going to check the Vault status. And we see that Vault is unsealed. Our process status shows that we're using this as our Vault configuration. So let's take a look at it. And we see that there's a plugin directory that's configured, and it points here. And there is our Vault Ethereum plugin sitting fat and happy. However, the mere fact that Vault has a reference to this plugins directory, and there's a plugin there, means nothing. We have to establish a trust relationship between Vault and this plugin. How do we do that? Well, this is how. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to write an entry to the Vault plugin catalog. We're going to tell Vault to trust the bytes on disk via a trusted SHA sum. All right? So we're basically saying this is the SHA sum for these, this, these bytes. Then we're going to provide some TLS material so that we can establish a mutually authenticated TLS connection between Vault and the plugin. Next, as the picture showed, we're going to mount the plugin at two different paths, a prod mount and a dev mount. And lastly, we're going to configure the prod mount to point to the Ethereum main net, and we're going to configure the dev mount to point to the Rinkeby test net. So let's do this.
All right. So let me take a peek at the process stat status after this. You notice we have two more vault processes running. These are the plugins at the dev mount and the prod mount. These processes are isolated from vault proper. So if one of them borks, it's not going to take down the vault server. Furthermore, if you're running on a real operating system, not like this MacBook, you can, you can lock memory so that process memory is isolated from each other. All right. So when we configured these two mounts, we saw a curious property scroll by. And this, is, this bound cider list is a typical network-oriented control where you whitelist a set of hosts that you want to be allowed to reach your Vault Ethereum plugin. In my case, the Vault Ethereum plugin. Now, I, I added this code to the plugin to do this. This is not just a given in, in the ecosystem. Now, let's play around with this. Let's, let's go ahead and oops, let's configure Vault. To only accept connections from an delit, whoops, I gotta authenticate, don't I? Let's log in as the mount administrator. This guy is only allowed to set configuration options on the mount. All right, great. Now what, what we've done is we've said that any address basically no address on this network, I hope, is allowed to reach our plugin. And to confirm this, we're going to try and reach an endpoint, a resource in our plugin, and that would be the convert resource. And sure enough, we see that the loopback address is unauthorized because it's not 10.2.3.4. Well, that seems interesting. Now let's play around a bit. I'm going to foobar this vault session. Now this vault session now should not be allowed to be permitted to do anything. So we'll demonstrate. And sure enough, we can't read the configuration at the mount because we're not authorized. However, our IP constraint still takes hold. Why is this? It's because the convert endpoint, the resource that's, that we're addressing, is unauthenticated. Why in the world would we have an unauthenticated endpoint in a Vault Secrets plugin? And to prove it's unauthenticated, let's go to the prod mount, which we did not put an IP constraint on. Sure enough, it works. So, Let's talk about the domain for a second, the Ethereum domain. Ethereum is denominated into several units of measure. There's ETH, which is typically correlated to that hyper-vacillating exchange rate in US dollars or euros or what have you. But every Ethereum transaction is transacted in way. And there are this many way in an ETH, right? I don't trust myself not to drop a decimal point when I'm dealing with that many zeros. I don't trust myself with a calculator to not trust and drop a decimal point. So why not have a trusted service that can do that conversion for us? And since this service isn't revealing any secrets, we don't need it to be authenticated. So this is kind of hinting at the idea of Vault as a platform, which is a way to provide assistance to developers so that they can build applications. And this kind of a service helps us build applications that can be safe and easy to use. All right, before I go back to the slides, I'm going to unset my foobard session, and I'm going to take off that IP constraint, because we'll use this mount later. Excellent. And boom. Cool. So we've discussed mounts and configurations in an unauthenticated path. And that, this brings us to 
what I think is the most important part of designing a vault plugin, and that's how you shape the resource tree that represents the secrets and services that your plugin is going to provide. This will almost certainly be an iterative process. So let's take a look at what I mean by a resource tree. So this models our domain. Here, you'll see accounts, which represent the private keys, operations on accounts like debits, signing transactions, transferring ERC-20 tokens. You'll see addresses, you'll see the convert endpoint, you'll see export, import, deploying of smart contracts. These resources won't, these paths will map, map directly to the code in our plugin. And this is where we make the, the first decision, which is which paths will be protected by vault policies, these guys here, which is the default, and which paths are special and we can make them unauthenticated. All right, these are paths that we just wanna trust that we're getting a good answer back, but there's no secrets revealed. All right. These protected paths are protected with vault policies. And here's a couple of examples of vault policies. These policies, it's, it, we need to, whoops, let me get my notes up here. We, we, we want to make, to, to avoid any possible confusion, I just want to let you know that when, vault policies only take effect after an actor is authenticated. They map permissions to a resource for an authenticated actor, all right? And I, I talked about our mission, which is to build a set of controls, right? We usually want fine-grained access controls. And I've heard this a couple of times in talks today. But these are very complicated to administer at any kind of scale. Your controls should be, ref these access controls should be reflective of common use cases. If your plugin is poorly designed, meaning the operations on your resource tree don't map organically to the use cases, to the policies you want to enforce. The demands of accommodating your, the, your user base or the, will lead to a, one of two bad outcomes. Either you will have overly permissive policies or you'll have burdensome policy provisioning workflows. Now I'm gonna contrive a use case and play around, but first, this is our pop quiz. If you remember my address, my uh, Twitter handle, all right, this is a tweet race. In the next couple of moments, I'm gonna show you how to create an Ethereum account with a Vault plugin. If you have an Ethereum account from a wallet, or if you are using, following along, paste an address that you have control of from the mainnet into a tweet, mention me, and add to the tweet hashiconf rocks, pound sign hashiconf rocks. All right, like I said, much wow will happen after that. Well, let's go back here and take a look. So our use case, we're going to demonstrate separation of duties in the en enterprise. We're going to demonstrate how Vault plugins can, can help us do this. And so I'm going to create a, an, a role for an account administrator. And this is somebody that would be governing an Ethereum account. And then I'm going to create some roles for users of an account. And there is no intersection between these two. And so, without further ado, I am going to log in as an admin. And this admin is what I am calling, oh, I'm so sorry. Is that better? Sorry. So, haha, <laughs> let me do this again. So we have a set of parallel policies for Dev and Prod, that admin HCL policy is our account administrator. Um, Cypher hat and immutability represent two users of Ethereum accounts. So what we're, we've just logged in as the account administrator. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two accounts and then I'll clarify what the remainder of the use case is. So we create the immutability account. We'll create the Cypherhead account. And this particular user cannot create any other accounts. So if you saw, he's not allowed to do that. Now let's push the boundaries of our demo here. When I look at this Cypher hat account that I just created, I see some interesting properties. And these are what I'm calling domain specific controls. And so this is the last layer of control that we're going to talk about. We have a blacklist which is a typical AML style control that prohibits sent transacting with a set of addresses. We have a spending limit total which caps how much spend we can we have over the, the lifetime of an account involved. We have a spending limit transactional which caps spend on a transactional basis. And we have a whitelist which is a list of our trusted transaction partners here. Notice, however, for the next part of the demo, I'm going to want to try and send some ether. And we don't have any balance here. And this is where it's going to get a little curious, because I want to talk to you about how we fund this in, 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 in this dev account. If this were prod, we'd have to mine ether right now. And I think that would put you all to sleep, because we'd probably have to wait for a couple of years, if possible. Um, or we'd have to go to a, an exchange and exchange fiat currency, aka real money, for cryptocurrency and then have it wired back to this address. But fortunately for us, we're on rink B and I can do this. I can say make it rain. If I can spell it, and I'll paste that address and I'm going to say bound hashiconf. All right, then I take this tweet, and then I go over to what's called the Rinkaby Faucet, which is a place to get free money. Um, now, what's going to happen now is that they're going to throw a CAPTCHA up here, and you're going to have to help me with this, because this screen is really tiny, and I can't see worth crap. So I need stairs. I think stairs are here. Here, tell me what, what they're, they're, these stairs over here. Eh. I don't know, maybe, maybe that one. You think right? Maybe. Nope, I screwed up. <laughs> Captures are the worst. Um, anybody see any stoplights at all? I'm serious. This is bad. Let's see if I can get it bigger here. Nope. All right, uh, maybe this is a stoplight, and yay, how about that? That was like, all right, now, oh, dag damn it. <laughs> all right, and sure enough, they gave us some free ether. Of course, it's not real, but it's, it still makes you feel good. So the next, what we're going to do is this is the use case we're going to play around. What we want to do is we want to say the Cypher hat account holder or account user is only allowed to send $20 at a time USD, $200 total, and only to the immutability account. And the immutability account is only allowed or is not allowed to send the Ether back to Cypher hat. So I'll show you how we do that. This command here says we're going to configure the Cypher hat account by setting a spending limit total of $200 USD denominated in way, transaction total 20 denominated in way, and only allowed to send to the immutability account. So let's go ahead and grab that. And we have governed that account. Now we're going to do 
this where we're going to set a blacklist on the immutability counter. It's a contrived use case, right? He, but he can't send this back. All right, so now we have, we know the cipher hat account is, is funded. So let's just go ahead and send it back. Uh-oh, we're the administrator. This is the separation of duties part, is we're not allowed to spend the ETH. We're only allowed to govern the account, all right? So we have to log in as the Cypher Hat user. Whoops, with the right password. And now, We can spend it, all right? Now, if we tried to send it back, of course we get a 403 because we're not immutability. So we're gonna log in as immutability and try and send it back. And sure enough, let's cat that command again. And let's try and send it back. Come on, cursor. Whoops. Boom. But of course we can't because he's blacklisted for using counterfeit ether probably. Um, all right. So we're approaching the end of the talk. I'm going to check to see if anybody actually gets any free ether here. I'm gonna have to do that again, that's annoying. So anybody mention me? Let's see notifications. Ooh, no, look at this, look at this. I see one, oh, I see a bunch of them, this is awesome. Let's pick the first one, don't you think that's fair? I think that's fair, there's Taylor Becker, there's Root, Root, the Root. Um, 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 I think what we have is a winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right. Let's take that puppy. We don't have any real cash, do we? Or real ether. What I'm going to do now is cold storage, baby. So I'm going to take our existing vault, which is only a demo vault, but we're gonna take it offline. And if I had more USB connections, I'd have two separate flash drives, one for unseal keys, and one for all the vault data, but I don't. So just understand that you should never keep your keys and your vault data in the same place. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this existing vault offline, we're gonna drop it the keys in the vault data onto the flash drive, but of course I'm in the wrong directory. We'll do it again. And all this does is kill vault, drop some files on the flash drive, and then rip them off your hard drive. So it's a pretty risky operation. Um, now, I'm gonna do the opposite, is I'm gonna take my corporate Ethereum wallet online, I am going to authenticate. And this is the part where if, if, if I can get access, I will need to, because this is real money. So I've added an additional control, which is MFA on my wallet. So as soon as I authenticate here, Duo will push to me, hopefully, Yes, and so here we go, click, boom, we're in, like Flynn. All right, now we're gonna say vault, read, and we're gonna look at the prod account. And look at that, we have a whopping 400 USD there. So I am going to take Taylor's address, I'm going to say cat policies 
winner. Whoops, cat policies winner. And I'm gonna take this. And I'm gonna go back and copy because I'm an idiot. Whoops. And, and you see what I'm doing here? I am, this is the one I didn't test because <laughs> it's real. Um, all right, so I'm sending to Taylor $20 USD denominated in way and permission is denied. Whew, good. <laughs> All right, what did I do wrong? Um, let's do this. Try, let's try and, I might have screwed up these policies. And the thing is, Let's try the other one. This is where the testing matters, right? Oh, eh. Let's try again, see if we can send from the immutability account, which has some, or did I bort these policies because I couldn't test it? Yes, Taylor, you are now $20 richer. All right, very good. Now what I'm gonna do is take this thing offline because I don't trust any of you. Okay. Boomy. All right. So we've talked about trusted execution, network constraints, fine-grained access controls, and we've talked about domain-specific controls. I think we've barely scratched the surface. But I think we've made the case that Vault is a platform for enterprise blockchain. Now, how important will Vault be to the blockchain? Well, I mentioned that large financial companies are in the process of embracing blockchain. This embrace will bring regulatory obligations that govern these institutions. For example, this popped up yesterday. So we're gonna have AML controls that are gonna be required to be implemented on the blockchain. How are you gonna do that? Well, of course, you're gonna use my Vault plugin as a prototype. Now, I think Vault will be the best platform for delivering these, the controls that enterprises need to adopt blockchain, which is why so many blockchain startups have it baked into their stacks. I've talked to several of these startups and the one common denominator, denominator that I've seen in their stacks is not Ethereum, it's not Bitcoin, it's Vault. Pretty damn slick. Um, now if you ask a blockchain aficionado, and I believe the term is futurist, about what the decentralized web will look like in five years, they'll tell you that a cryptographically manifest identity will be the focal point of all applications which is actually not too dissimilar for what enterprise experts are saying. Applications are becoming more and more identity centric and identity is becoming more aligned with self-administered cryptography. Regardless of which version of the future you subscribe to, I think Vault will be part of it. Thank you.